you must have seen in your career some acquisitions that have gone badly uh, for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, could you sort of tell me what the main reasons are or some horror stories so then if you know we're selling or buying, we know what things to avoid? Yeah. Well, most of the time it comes down to a difference between skills and expectations. <laughs> So a lot of the times entrepreneurs will end up, um, enter the acquisition entrepreneurship space having read something or listened to a blog. And of course, it's a great idea. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that in our business wouldn't be as, as thriving as it is right now. But the point being is if you've got someone who buys an e-commerce business because it's making $100,000 a year and they pay, call it, two and a half times multiple for that. Mm -hmm. So they pay $250,000 for that business. They then take it over and they then say, oh gee, the Facebook cost base is pretty aggressive, isn't it? Let's cut back on that. Well, all of a sudden the revenue drops off this thing. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they take over Facebook, but they say, I don't wanna pay the agency that was running it before. So they try to do it themselves because, hey, Facebook ads is easy. <laughs> And all of a sudden, things don't work as well as they had planned. Yeah. So most of the come, most of the time, a bad acquisition happens as a result of difference between skill set yeah, yeah. and necessity. Yeah. Um, very rarely, it's because you overpay for an asset, right? Very rarely, it tends to mean you tend to overpay when there's large numbers of buyers also interested in the same assets, so there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously in traditional M&A, they often go so poorly or horribly wrong. I think 60% of them or something. And, and most of the time it's because it's not their core business. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this world, they actually rarely go wrong because the person who's acquiring it is so desperate for it to succeed. Yeah, because that's part of it since their business. You're not talking to um, a political executive that yeah. it was detached from the rest of the business. So, yeah. but, but it's also riskier, right? Like the, the, the numbers are far less, but when someone chooses to spend $25,000 on Flipper, that's a, that's a big move for them. Mm. It's the same risk ratio as the person who spent $250,000 on Flipper or $2.5 million on Flipper, but it's very different when a corporate goes and spends two, $250 million on an asset, or in some cases, $2.5 billion on an asset, it's quite frankly not their core business. Very few of the exec team work on it, care about it, or have a bonus tied to it. <laughs> and so it's highly likely that it's, it's, it's not gonna go as well as they once so thought. The one thing I'll say is it's about return, right? So let's just, let's just do the numbers on this quickly. So if I buy, um, so an asset's doing $500 a month. Um, so it's doing 6,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And I go and pay $15,000 for that asset. And it does the exact same thing the next year. That's a 40% annualized return on my investment. Yeah, good point. So it, it, it actually doesn't have that higher risk profile compared to what people think. It's not an NFT, I'm all for <laughs> NFTs, but it's, it's, it's not speculative. Yeah. The business makes money and it will continue to make money so long as it's operated the same way.